Hello and welcome. I'm very happy that everyone is joining us and very happy to be co-hosting this conversation with Audrey Hudson, Associate Curator of School Programs and Early Learning at the AGO, in conversation with Cyrus Marcus Ware and Wendy Ng. Thank you all for being here today. I'm Davianni Saltzman, Director of Public Programming at the AGO. Say hi, guys. <laughs> Hi. We're very excited about this. Um, we're going to have a great conversation today, but before we begin, I would like to acknowledge where we are operating, even in the digital space. The Art Gallery of Ontario and all cultural producers are working on the territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat, and the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy to peaceably care for the lands around the Great Lake which are also governed by a, a treaty between the government of Canada and the Mississaugas of the credit. I'd also like to say that the acknowledgement's just a very and very small step in a long conversation around decolonization and uh, anti-oppression, which is what we're here to discuss today. So without further ado, turning over to my co-host, Audrey Hudson, to introduce our guests. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we are here with Cyrus Marcus Ware and Wendy Ng to talk about uh, anti-oppressive education within museums. And so I'm going to ask the panelists to just to give a couple sentences of who you are, uh, a little bit of insight into what you do, and then we can uh, go for it. Cyrus, maybe do you want to start? Sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm Cyrus Marcus Ware. I'm uh, an activist, an artist, an academic, an educator. Um, I am currently a doctoral candidate in the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York University, specifically studying the experiences of racialized and disabled people in art museums, art institutions, uh, and art spaces. Um, I'm also exploring Black activist culture and things like prison abolition and other strategies to get towards freedom. A lot of my publication record has been really rooted in this question of like, how do we root out white supremacy and anti-blackness within institutions, but also within larger systems of power like academic industrial complexes and the prison industrial complexes and stuff like that. Um, I have uh, worked with Wendy uh, writing uh, quite a bit about diversity in museums. I've also worked with Jillian McIntyre. We co-edited a journal of museum education issue on diversity in, in museums. And I've written quite a bit about that. Uh, most recently wrote about anti-blackness in art spaces for Canadian art. Um, I've been working uh, for the last six years at the BAM Center um, doing what they so called so-called so Jedi kind of work within their leadership division, justice, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion work, teaching arts leaders from across the world who come to the BAM Center how to do that work well and how to become leaders in doing that work. Um, and more and more, I've been bringing my activism into this, into this sort of uh, advocacy uh, work. Uh, I am an activist. Um, I'm somebody who lives at a, an intersection, several intersections. I'm a Black person. I'm a disabled person. I'm a mad person. I'm a queer person. I'm a trans person. I'm a parent. So I'm in this sort of intersection. And I've known because of that from a very young age that this world needed to change, that, that this wasn't a place where we were all thriving. Um, and so I knew that change was possible. And so I became an activist and have been an activist for about 25 years. And that's really coming into my work in museums and galleries a lot more. Um, and then, as I mentioned, I'm an artist. I draw large scale portraits of activists. I do performance and plays and try to imagine futures where um, those people who are most marginalized actually get to survive, where we get to thrive, where we get to live full and self-determined lives. Um, for, the, for 12 years, I worked at the Art Gallery of Ontario as an educator, I got to work uh, doing public programs in education with such an amazing, diverse group through the Youth Council, through the Free After Three program. And um, I love museum education, and I'm so happy to see the changes happening that we're witnessing right now. Thank you. And your legacy does live on at the AGO, as you know, but I just wanted to, yeah, definitely let you know that. Yeah, thank you for your work. Uh, Wendy? Uh, so I've been in the field of education and specifically museum education for almost 20 years. Uh, I originally started as a classroom teacher. So I had intended to teach art and geography at the secondary level. 
I ended up uh, falling into museums. I literally did not realize that you could actually have a career as an educator in these institutions. It never occurred to me because I never felt these institutions were spaces for me. I didn't see people who looked like me. I didn't see other racialized people and the collections, how they were interpreted, were never interpreted in a, in a way when I was growing up in Toronto in a way that I felt connected to me personally. So it's a, it's a wonder that I actually work in this field now, <laughs> considering my early experiences were not necessarily positive. And so I originally I started as a classroom teacher and then I fell into working in museums. Um, my first museum job was actually at the Science Museum in London, England. And there I was doing internet based projects for educational audiences. And this was back in like 2002 when I started there. So the internet and creating a website, you know, coding as it's known now was um, pretty new uh, for folks. Um, and so my job was to teach students and teachers how to do that work and provide support their skill development so they could be part of this new internet world, you know, and have agency and voice within it. So that was my first foray into the, in, into the field and I loved it. I was like, what is this? I want to continue. So I ended up getting a graduate degree from the George Washington University in the education program and have been, um, and that was back in 2006 and I've been back in Toronto, which is home for me um, since then. So. I've worked uh, at a number of institutions. I like to see myself as someone who is uh, trying to create change from within the institutions. And so that started really after grad school at the Harborfront Center, um, then at the AGO. Um, I was brought on during Transformation AGO, and that's how I met Cyrus, so thankful for that. And uh, we were the only two racialized people in the department at the time. Like, full-time, part-time staff. I think we were the only two. Yeah. And so, you know, oftentimes when you're one of the few, you gravitate towards each other because you become your support systems for each other within these institutions that don't support you necessarily. And so it was really, really necessary to have that support as we kind of navigated the institution and tried to create change where we were. So I coordinated elementary school and teacher programs at the EGO uh, for gosh, almost, was it seven years, six years? Um, and then, um, and it, it was really exciting actually because we, it was part of Transformation AGO, so we were able to re-envision school programs entirely and rethink, you know, the school experience and, and the team, the team of educators and volunteers who actually delivered that experience. And so that was exciting. Um, then I ended up jumping to the Royal Ontario Museum where I managed the learning department for six years. Um, and in that capacity, um, I managed three areas and primarily the focus was establishing Indigenous education and digital learning as our primary strategic priorities. And the six years was spent building that capacity at the ROM to do that work, like starting with no Indigenous staff, no digital learning staff, and building that in six years to ensure that those two strategic priorities were led by and centered uh, com the community's most impacted Indigenous peoples. And so um, I ended up leaving that position and I am currently a manager at, in the school programs department at the Ontario Science Centre. So I'm super excited about that. You both have very long histories in this work and I find often, and as Cyrus, you were mentioning, we're, we're in the midst of a reckoning and a revolution that we, we get lost in the moment, not realizing that the long game has been long and arduous, especially for people inside colonial legacy spaces. So I'm gonna to get to my question, but I'm kind of curious, what are you both working on now in your respective spaces in terms of anti-oppression within museums and culture? And of course, Cyrus, many thanks because your most recent, you have many contributions, but your your piece, uh, Ending Anti-Black Racism in Canadian Art Institutions that came out in Canadian Art a week and a half ago was a huge part of that. So um, you've given us your background. Can you tell us what your key focuses are now around anti-oppression in museum and culture? Well, I think it's so exciting to be in a moment where we can actually name what's happening 
I think that what we, you know, have been struggling, as you say, this is a long game, strong game, uh, you know, action. And I think that what we've been trying to do for the last 15 years, really, I, I would even go back to that AAM brief in 1991 or whatever that we cite in our article. We've been trying to get the, the field to recognize that there's an issue with diversity, that there's an issue with racism, that there's an issue with colonialism, that there's an issue with white supremacy. Well, now we're here. We can actually have that conversation. So a lot of my work right now has been trying to um, ad to 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 ad get museums and galleries to do the structural work, the actual structural work that would make the changes happen that we need desperately for them to happen in order to, to for that for these institutions to be for all of us. You know, so if you want to have senior leadership reflective of the diversity of Ontario, if you want to have the collection actually have major works by Black Canadian artists, you know, which is a very under-collected group, if you want to make sure that your staff body has deaf, mad, and disabled people in it, you know, if you want to make sure that you're building the museum that we that we want, that the, the institution of the future, you know, we have to be able to to accept that there's a, that there's an issue and that we're, we're going to work on the structural changes. Mm -hmm. So I think that what we saw 30 years of is we just need more training. Mm -hmm. We should do some more anti-oppression training. Oh. We should get someone in from outside. Don't listen to the racialized people and the people who are experiencing marginalization on staff, who are probably the experts at what needs to change in the institution. Get someone in from outside who's going to do a day or a half day, uh, and then and then we're going to consider the matter done. And I think that that's that's been the model for a very long time. And what people are saying now is. No, it's time for, for, for actual change. And so we want action. We want to see demonstrative act, demonstrated action um, that it will actually address some of the root causes. So, you know, one of the first <laughs> the things that they say, the first step is admitting that you have the problem. Uh, so white supremacy is a problem. You know, when you look at the history of institutions, particularly legacy institutions that have, you know, a hundred year history, a lot of their origins are quite murky. They're quite messy and they're quite, uh, sometimes it's a lot of blood money, you know, that and the, the sort of process of colonization that has fueled some of the origins of these institutions, not all of them, but some of them, and being able to address that history as a way of understanding what we want to do differently in the future, I think is really key. So I'm very excited about this moment. I've been, I've been working to try to push from all the angles. And I think that, you know, it's not, you know, this moment where, you know, museums and galleries are finally having this. I mean, in the States, my, my, my twin works at the American Museum of Natural History. They just took down their Teddy Roosevelt statue. And why did they take it down? Well, the, the, the people were going to take it down for them right? It was going to go in the river. So, so there's this moment where museums and galleries and institutions are having to reckon with what's happening in the world. And then you look at the current events and how there's this confluence of current events. The, the white lawyers in the States, the McClowskis, who, who took their assault rifles and armed them at Black Lives Matter protesters um, in, in, in Missouri, uh, are art collectors, major art collectors. They own a Van Dyke, they own, like they're part of the art world. So to me, I'm like, what is happening right now where this, this the, the history of white supremacy that is steeped within the art world is being unearthed. And we have finally have an opportunity to sort of talk about it and hopefully build a better world together. A, a museum and a gallery and a space that is actually a forum, that is actually for everyone, that is actually part of the community, that is actually, you know, showcasing all of us. I'm really excited for this moment. It, it is super exciting and I'm, uh, Wendy, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Just before that, Cyrus, I mean, when you both write in your article, and Audrey's going to get to this, the, the article you wrote in 2017, um, I don't understand why we're, I mean, I do, but it's about not being afraid to, to put the, the same criticality that institutions put towards their programming and their exhibition programming towards us internally. That actually, that's not a source of fear and risk. It's actually a source of strength. That's my personal perspective is like mm -hmm. actually admitting and being vulnerable is, as you said, the acknowledgement, looking at the, looking at the hard paths to be able to move forward into meaningful public forum. But it's so interesting that it's equated with fear and weakness instead of actually strength and meaning. That's just sharing that thought. 
Yeah, and I think that there are so many ways that we, we, we see these institutions wanting to be leaders and to take leadership roles in the community in setting the direction. Why not take a leadership role in this? Why not try to be the best possible example of what a museum or gallery could be? Why not be that guy? That's who you should be trying to be. Wendy, briefly before we get to Audrey's next question, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing in the, your science center role around anti-oppression work in the museum context? Sure. I mean, it's really interesting. You know, Cyrus talks about structural change and systemic change, and that's really at the core of what is necessary. It's always been necessary, but even now, like the, the current conditions are holding museums and galleries directly accountable. It's almost like, you know, um, the public now, you know, the curtain, we're in the Wizard of Oz and the curtain has been pulled back and we see museums and galleries for what they are. And the public can see that very clearly. And we are accountable to our public. So it's not gonna be good enough anymore to have you know, shows of artists of only like white male artists of you know, how many impressionist shows do we really need? How many? <laughs> and so you know, it's, it's really exciting time, but it's also interesting as someone who I've worked in an art gallery, science center, science museum, a Holocaust museum, and um, in encyclopedic museum. And it's really interesting to me how the work culture within these institutions is reflective of the content of their collections. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's for me coming now back into a science center setting where I first started my career, I think that's why I was excited about the field. Because in science centers, They've always been about how do we make science as accessible to the broad public as possible. It's always been rooted in how can we show the sciences in our everyday life, in all that we do, and how can we make it accessible. Um, the Science Center celebrated its 50th birthday last year, and so for as the first science center in Canada, and so for 50 years that's been its aim. Having said that, we recognize that the science we put out on the floor. Um, historically, you know, as a field has been rooted in Western science, right, and Western ways of knowing, which are very Eurocentric, binary, you know, and so how do we ensure that now we are continuing to create a platform for ways of knowing that have been marginalized from these science center spaces. And I mean, that work has happened at the science center, but this, the current environment um, ensures that we are continuing that work into a greater degree, you know, and so it's not enough to um, institutions of these size of the size often will um, consult with community members in a kind of extractive process, like we'll extract your knowledge or your guidance. Sometimes they do and don't repay that in real terms, mm -hmm. but the community members are often outside of the institution. Right? And that's a, a position of power as an institution. So I'm really about how do we actually change the institution from the inside? So much of this diversity inclusion work has focused um, on our audiences and external facing work, but we need to change the guts. You know, we need to like tear it down and we need to change fundamentally like the fabric of these institutions, who works in them, you know, whose voices do we privilege, whose knowledge systems do we privilege, Whose do we omit? Uh, who do we actively erase from these spaces? And how do we fundamentally change the inside? Because then that will manifest in our outside, you know, uh, products and experiences and engagements. So that's really what, you know, whether it really hasn't mattered for me what institution I'm in, that work has always been central to me personally and professionally. But it's just interesting for me to be back in a science environment where science is really you know, fundamentally, it's about questioning the world around you and that inquiry. Um, and that's a very different space than an art gallery, in my experience. Thank you. Over to Audrey. Thank yeah, thank you, Wendy. Um, and this is a really nice uh, kind of pr uh, prelude to the next question. But I do want to say before I move on, um, Wendy, your uh, legacy is also felt uh, in the education school programs at the AGO. Um, your team, my team now, <laughs> um, uh, we are very aware. So uh, thank you as well for doing that work. Uh, um, and so I want to think about, uh, yeah, the writing that the both of you have done together and thinking about the museums as uh, museums as a construct. 
and the questions that you raised in your 2014 article, which is uh, uh, in multiculturalism in art museums today in 2014, and then uh, thinking about 2017 in your article, Activating Diversity and Inclusion, a blueprint for museum educators as allies and change makers. So both have provided a really great practical strategies for enacting equitable relationships with visitors and staff uh, along the lines of social dis difference. So can you speak to what changes you have witnessed since publication? And you can go to the 2014 article as we were speaking before, it's a, a three year increment, so 2014, 17, and then uh, 2020. So what changes have you witnessed since publication? And can you speak to how uh, we as educators uh, place emphasis on anti-oppressive education in museums? Either, do you want to go first, Wendy, on this one? Uh, sure. I mean, I think it's interesting in preparing for this, I reread our chapter and then our article. Um, that article, by the way, was also co-authored with Alyssa Greenberg. I know she's watching, so hello, Alyssa. Um, and so it's interesting. Uh, yeah, they're in three-year increments. It's now 2020. I feel like, hmm, like it's always been rooted in self, self-critical reflection and analysis and rigor. Like so much of the diversity, equity, inclusion work has been like surface level, you know, overtures to, oh, we need to be diverse. Okay, let's be concrete. What are you actually doing? <laughs> that, that's really, I think, was the intention behind both pieces of writing was how do we um, develop a more critical, more rigorous approach to this work that really gets to the heart of the fact that these institutions are rooted in white supremacy. And how does white supremacy manifest in the work? I think when we wrote the uh, 2017 article, you know, we um, were aware of like it was radical, too radical for some folks in the field and then not radical enough. And we had debates about using the term ally, for example, and not accomplice or co-conspirator. And it was almost like, let's use ally as a way, you know, as like the carrot for folks <laughs> to you know, engage and then get into the article and talk about accomplices and co-conspirators and what does that mean? And what does white supremacy, the scary word for some, mean in institutions? How does it manifest in everyday ways of working and interaction? So, you know, I think it's been interesting to see um, in the field, like, you know, in 2014, going to conferences and presenting, like I presented with Cyrus, with Alyssa, with Elizabeth Sweeney, you know, with Kiana Hendrick, amazing folks in the field and like even saying the word white supremacy was like oh my gosh like can we even say that word mm -hmm. and now it's, it's everyone says it because we all recognize it's a problem and it's goes back to like it first admitting you have the problem you have to admit it mm -hmm. <laughs> and now we're finally there at admitting it even though it has been years of folks saying this is a problem so I, that's a change i've seen in the field mm. good thank you yeah. oh go ahead Sarsa. oh i was just gonna um build on that is that okay yeah yeah go ahead <laughs> yeah yeah i think that that's exactly it right is that now anti-blackness and white supremacy are on the on the table so we can talk about it you know in relation to our collections in relation to staffing i mean that was one of the big things in the articles that we wrote was that we were saying hey we have a problem that the only racialized people that you're hiring are not in decision making roles you know so they're in facility services they're cooking in the kitchen they're you know they're in these particular roles that are very they're in security they're they're important roles in the institution but they're not decision making roles and so what does it mean to not be affecting the power structure in terms of how decisions are being made without having racialized people in those spaces so so you know those are those are some big changes that we can actually talk about it but I think about that important book, Mounting Frustrations, that Susan Cahan wrote, Art in the, or the Art Museum in the Age of Black Power. And what she really articulates is she studied 60 years of change uh, in relation to black uh, liberation in, in museums. And she says that it's really only in times of social unrest, in times of political upset in society, that museums and galleries um, 
acquiesce to talking about diversity or to, you know, suddenly bringing in Black artists, you know, to do temporary, never permanent um, inst interventions or installations. And so I'm aware, this is why I say we need structural change. You know, this can be a moment where now maybe we can talk about anti-Blackness and white supremacy, but what happens when people stop rioting in the streets and when people stop painting murals on every building and when people stop taking the statues down and things kind of go back to normal, will we still be able to talk about this um, when the spotlight is off, you know? And so that's why I think what we're asking for now and what we were asking for in 2017 and what we were asking for in 2014 and what people were asking for in the 1990s after the Rum uh, Into the Heart of Africa exhibit was we want to see policy, we want to see hiring changes, we want to see acquisition changes, we want to see budgetary and, and financial decisions being made differently to actually be, you know, investing in the communities that are that are being marginalized in particular by this field. We want to address systemic classism in our field. We want to address all of these things and we want them addressed through concrete action, actions that can't be erased or undone by one person leaving. Right, so we know in museums, there's often a champion who's really pushing for equity and diver diversity, including often unsung, often in the education, in the basement, you know, doing the work. And then when that person leaves, that, you know, the, the, because there wasn't any structural support for it or any institutional buy-in, you know, sometimes that work leaves too. So I think that that's, uh, you know, something that we have to kind of push for. I mean, another thing that I think is, you know, I am encouraged by what's happening within some of the arts education environments. So thinking about the important work that folks like Andrea Fatona and Dory Turnstile are doing at OCAD U and really wishing that there was, you know, in terms of bringing in Black uh, voices, bringing in Black scholarship, Black leadership within to an arts institution that had traditionally not had those voices centered. And I wish that we could see stuff like that happening within museum studies, right? Because museum studies, if you look at museums and institutions, well, what's feeding the workers? Like, wh what's the feeder, the, the stream, the, the, the tributary that's leading into these institutions that sees arts, uh, museum studies uh, departments, arts education, educational settings that are also not diverse, that are also not having a curriculum that's reflective of the diversity of Toronto or of Ontario or of Canada. So I'm really encouraged to see some changes happening in places like OCADU, and I hope that those continue in other educational settings as well. Um, yeah, because I think that that will help to address some of the structural changes too, is that we'll have more people coming into the field. And of course, we also have to get away from the elitism that says that you have to have a graduate degree in order to do this work, because there are incredible people in our communities who have been doing the work of preserving, discussing, talking about, critiquing, engaging with cultural objects and production from within our communities who don't have a graduate degree, but who would be an amazing educator and who have been doing the education work in their communities. So that too. Sorry, I'm gonna Thank jump you. in on question, I guess three, but if there's- Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Just, 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 yeah, thank you. Um, uh, just thinking about what the both of you had said and then, then on that last point, right? Like uh, thinking about how do we nurture the next generation? How do we uh, ensure that, you know, like we are, we are a generation. So how do we make sure that continue, that continuation um, uh, does actually continue, right? It's the training, it's the mentorship and it's, and which I'm sure all of you are doing, myself included, uh, so that we can, um, so that we can hold these spaces. And one of my, uh, you know, something that came up in one of my talks, uh, my friend Emmanuel uh, Tabby said, why are people caring about us now? Why are people caring about Black people right now? And it is this revolution, it is this time, and they're actually, be, it's almost like they're being forced to, and if you're not thinking about anti-Black racism and white supremacy right now, you are going to be left behind. So it's almost like, you must, if you want your institution to survive, this is what you have to do right now. Um, and so I think it's, uh, it's amazing and it's, it's, it's invigorating and it's really scary also. And there's a lot of trepidation at this time, but to see what comes next and see, to see what comes out of this, I think is really um, going to be pivotal for museum studies, education and the world. Yeah, I'm just putting my hand up like a student. Like, <laughs> Every the teacher, education. right? <laughs> yeah. Always the educator. Yep. Um, teacher. Um, so 
I think just to build on that, you know, fundamentally, it's not like we don't know what to do. There's plenty of concrete actions that can be taken mm -hmm. at all different levels, whether you're talking about the pipeline into these institutions, whether you're talking about, you know, curatorial frameworks, whether you're talking about educational programming, whether you're talking about executive leadership, hiring, like, there's plenty of how to's. It's the political will. It's the will of the institution that has always been the stopping point, the wall, right? And by that, I mean the executive will, right? Let's be honest, we don't need an article telling us about the crisis of whiteness in art galleries. We don't need that. Yeah. Uh, we've all known this, you know? And so, but what the crisis is, is a lack of will, a lack of will to concretely operationalize this work in very specific ways across the institution. And I, my hope is that this current environment is pushing and li quite, quite literally forcing some institutions to reckon with that lack of will. And so that's what I'd like to see happen is that enough of this talk of, oh, we need to diversify. No, sh show me the money, show me like, you know, the budget, the, the people, the executive leadership. What does that look like and what needs to change? You know, be very concrete because now the public is going to hold you accountable. Yeah, that that's exactly kind of and, and this is coming up. I'm just noting there's a lot of questions coming up in the audience and I might we might pull some in as well, which is some of the public are asking what what have, what can we as the public do in addition to obviously the public statements and protests that are happening to specifically hold museums, museums to task museum executives to task to instill structural change. So on the practical front for people watching. I mean, are those letters. I mean, people have already obviously commented on statements, but do you have any examples or thoughts on how the public can weigh in on structural change within cultural space? Well, I think that it's important to recognize that institutions fundamentally are responsible to their visitors, right? So you actually have a lot of power as the visitors, you know, because the things that you say and the things that you do, the institution does take note and does try to respond. So you actually can be in support of museum workers of color, of museum educators of color. You can be in support of artists, black artists who are not getting shown in these environments, you know, who, who you know, you can really push for the institution for the kinds of changes that we want to see happen. Just as one example, uh, in Seattle, the Intamin Theater uh, was a, a, a sort of a legacy theater um, and it had been mostly run by white uh, leadership. And Andrew Russell was uh, a, a white leader who uh, uh, was running the theater. And he was like, wait a minute, you know, structural change isn't gonna happen unless actually people who are in the decision-making roles and the power roles start to step aside. Right? So unless that actually starts to happen, I don't see the structural changes coming. And so he ended up making a succession plan to step aside, even though he was at the peak of his career, to step aside and to have a Black person uh, take that role. You know, then looking in Toronto, in Toronto, Catherine Hernandez recently stepping aside from Be Current to make space for Black leadership. So I think that, you know, as visitors, you can be checking to see which institutions are making the kinds of structural changes that are going to result in any demonstrative change for the actual people who are involved. Yes, you can write letters. You know, yes, you can, you can, you know, fill out comment cards. You know, yes, you can push for for change, you know, push for change. But but fundamentally, we have to go beyond just um, uh, thinking about uh, surface changes. We have to, we, we, what we need visitors to be pushing for is structural changes. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, Debbie has the next question. Yeah, I kind of I kind of took our next question and turned it into that around kind of also, I think a lot about recruitment. And I think about right. recruitment and culture and I don't come from the museum world and, feel like I was also at Banff Cyrus in terms of as a first woman of color in a role a directorship these these roots have to be in the minds of recruiters and executive leadership etc sorry I'm just kind of going off on a on a tangent around structural change I, I guess the the next question is is really about the the gap between statements and commitments and what commitments I'm going to say do museums have to make and we've already slightly touched on this to actually specifically make um, spaces equitable for BIPOC staff within them. All of us work as BIPOC staff within, or I mean, you have in the past, Iris, but also do with Banff within these spaces. What do we need to ensure a fair and equitable space for workers within these institutions? 
fundamentally, we need to be hiring Black and Indigenous leadership uh, through the board, the senior staff, and at all levels of the institution. Because until we change the staff makeup, there's always going to be a message to particular people who are always the only one in the room that, you're, that you don't belong, that this isn't a place for you, that we didn't expect you, that we didn't anticipate you. So we need to hire leaders. We need to diversify our collections, even if it requires deacquisitioning some other works, you know, make it a priority to have a collection that is diverse and that the curators are able to draw on a beautiful, diverse set of, uh, of works to, to be able to tell the stories that they tell. Address the cultures of white supremacy that are at work in the institution. So, does your curatorial staff repeatedly come up with exhibition titles like the dark such and such to mean bad, evil, or whatever? Like enough of that. You don't need to be doing stuff like that anymore in 2020. You know, are Black and Indigenous people able to advance in your institution? Are they staying in the same position for five years, for 10 years, for 15 years, while white people are moving up and moving into positions of leadership? Check and see if that's happening. Are Black and Indigenous artists being commissioned? Is their work being critiqued, being cataloged? Is it being exhibited? Is it being put into the permanent collection? And if not, why not? So, and then lastly, take leadership from the communities who have been most affected by hundreds of years of marginalization from the field. So go to the communities, don't, not for extraction, and then leave, but like go and actually start to build relationships and take direction from people who have been traditionally left out of the field. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and also yeah. um, curatorial feeds into what programming can do, right? And what education can do. And so if we start, you know, if that's where we start and the purchasing of Black Canadian artists, of BIPOC artists, uh, yeah, to be in the permanent collection and to be on, um, on display as well. But so much of that feeds into what we can do as educators if we only have, I'm just going to use this example, an impressionism show, how much, how diverse is our our education program is going to be on offer for schools and how can we support teachers if that is what we are given to work with right and so uh being in this position at the ago uh you know oftentimes are you know the most vibrant or the most um excited that kids get or students get when they come in is around the work that reflects them reflects their stories and their narratives uh in toronto if we are going to reflect Toronto uh, or Ontario, uh, this, it has to change uh, institutionally, has to be structural. And so uh, I want to go to, there is a question, um, if you're all okay with this, uh, there's a question that uh, um, it's from your co-author, uh, Alyssa Greenberg, is that, do you, do you see a tension between the efforts towards accountability, so focused on changes in internal and external museum policy, and movement towards abolition? Can, can I, before we jump to that, can I just um, kind of yes. continue on the thread about structural and systemic change? Because I think it does tie into Alyssa's question. So I think in addition to all the things that Cyrus has outlined, like very clearly, we talked yeah. about actionable items, very actionable. It is also fundamentally, you know, um, Audre Lorde's quote about the master's tools dismantling the master's house. Like mm -hmm. we need to first, I think it's two questions. One is if we choose to maintain these institutions, what new tools do we need to enact to dismantle them, right? Because we can't use this, the master's tools. We need to think about what are some new tools to do that. So I think about like governance structure. How are museums governed? What is the governance structure of museums? You know, that's really rooted in Western understandings of hierarchy and power. Can we actually re-envision entirely a governance structure that is rooted in indigenous governance systems, for example. Like fundamentally, that would be a huge act of decolonization right there. You know, and I think about things like the organizational structure. It's very much a pyramid, right? Very few institutions have really tackled that pyramid to create a different shape and a shape that truly is, you know, not hierarchical, you know, that is truly rooted in relationships. What would that look like if we re envisioned this pyramid into some other form? What if it was a circle? It's what would that look like? Like, I really, I, I really think that not only do we have like concrete actions like blind hiring and, you know, um, 
diversifying the applicant pool. But let's rethink and reimagine what the very structures of these institutions can look like. That's what I'd like to see as part of this work. Very well said. Mm -hmm. And I think you. this oh. tension, I mean, this tension really, there is, a, I mean, th this important work of, of the efforts towards being accountable, you know, focusing on external and external change, internal and external changes is so crucial right now. But there is a groundswell of organizing and activism from the people saying we want to abolish a lot of the institutions that are no longer serving us. So I think that where I see the tension is it's sort of like uh, climate change. We know that we have maybe 18 good months left. Are we gonna act in time or are we gonna waste this moment? And we'll find out at the end of the 18 months that it was too late to act. That's what the crisis in museums is. And that's what the crisis in a lot of these institutions are, is that people are literally in the streets taking things apart. <laughs> and what they're saying is we want to see change and we want to see it now. And if we don't see change, we need to abolish the institutions that are no longer serving us and create new ones that will. And so I think the crisis and the tension is whether or not the institution is going to react quickly enough to make the changes that need to be made before the people say it's time to abolish you. And I think that we're, we're in that moment right now. And I think that we, the, the expression that I always heard when I was working in large institutions was that trying to change a large institution was like trying to steer a battleship and to turn it in, you know, and it moves really, really, well, that's, that's not going to work because there is a flotilla of hundreds of other smaller boats of the people who are right beside us saying, turn this boat. We're right here, turn this boat. So the boat has to turn. And I think that whether it happens quick enough is what we rem remains to be seen. Living it in every moment. It's real time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna go to the last question and uh, around cultivating wellness and, uh, and care in various spaces. So in doing this work uh, internally, um, like you've both said, like look at our, look at the staff, like ask, ask us uh, <laughs> about our experiences, you know, uh, before you go external um, and we, we would have a lot to share, right? So uh, I'm thinking about um, taking care. You know, these are tumultuous times. These are intense uh, times. These are exciting and invigorating, uh, revolutionary times. Uh, so in doing this work, how are you able to take care uh, in these, uh, in this time of, you know, severe change, activism and upheaval? And how do we cultivate wellness uh, within museums and within education and programming? Um, I would say uh, one big thing is, um, like I've worked in institutions that are largely unionized. So the union structure offers, it is part of the same system, right? And I would say that, you know, this work also needs to happen within unions as someone who was in a union as a member and now outside of it, working with unionized staff, that, you know, I have been in situations where, you know, both the union has supported racialized staff and then not supported racialized staff, you know, um, that have defended, you know, white fragility at the expense of the health and well-being of racialized staff. So I really do think that, you know, when we talk about wellness, it's how do we create safe spaces um, for Black, Indigenous, racialized staff who truly feel supported, that it is their own space, that they can support each other, and that there is a system to, that is recognized in this institution to support them. Because so much of this work is traumatizing. Like mm -hmm. straight up, it is traumatizing to work within these institutions, especially as agents of change. So to the point where many people leave the field because enough is enough, right? You got to take care of yourself, your health and well-being. So it is incumbent upon both the institution and the other institutions within them, like unions, to support their racialized members. And, you know, I've been in institutions where the staff have done it for themselves because there has been no formal mechanism of support. So I actually think of like to Cyrus's article about fractured atlas and their process. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I was really fascinated with that because that fundamentally is part of the trauma inducing, you know, process that happens when you constantly have to work against white fragility. Um, it is tiring. So how can that system that you've talked about 
people that fractured atlas of cakes address that? Yeah, fractured atlas is this, it's sort of this fascinating, uh, as an arts org, you know, and they do strategic HR and they, you know, they do a, a group and caucus uh, model, which is something that we used in activism in the 90s. You know, I, I was very familiar with it from our organizing, but it's this idea that you take, if there's a dominant group, and in this case, you know, they, they take white members and they have a separate group where they, they meet, they talk, they try to address white privilege, white supremacy, they do readings, they do all sorts of work on their own in their own space uh, to not re-traumatize the racialized members of the staff. The racialized members of the staff have their own caucus group where they also get to talk and gather and share resources, but really their time is their own. They don't, they don't, they're not responsible to the white group in the same way that the, the white group is responsible to being accountable to the racialized members to make sure that they're doing work in service of, the, of what the racialized members need to, have, to happen. So it's a really beautiful model. And, and um, um, there's some amazing uh, Laura Ruffin and um, Tim Sanova, you know, who are doing such incredible work. They have a podcast called Work Does Shouldn't Suck, which has some great uh, stuff that you can watch about how, just how to do this uh, well. And I think, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm really drawn to this Tony Cade Bambara quote that the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. And I think that that has been my, I think when we think of care, like that is very much part of my work. My activism is part of my care because I'm trying to heal the world. I'm trying to make a better world so that my daughter will grow up with less trauma, so that my great grandchildren will be free finally. Um, so I think of the strategies for survival. Wendy mentions this brain drain where all of these brilliant leaders of color are leaving the field because of the violence that they're facing or just being passed over for opportunities or not getting a chance to advance or not getting to share their brilliance with the world because they're relegated to parts of the museum where they where they don't get to to do the to do their best work um you know and i think that uh you know that the strategies for surviving that we can turn to activism again, you know, so we can turn to the work of disability justice organizers in the Bay Area, like Leah Lakshmi, Piepshina Samarasina, um, uh, uh, Rebel Stacy Black, uh, Stacy Melbourne, who did this thing called pod mapping. So in your, so this is, I'm really interested in museum workers of color, artists, of color, people who are in these institutions who need to figure out a way to survive, create a pod map, a map of who your allies are in your institution, who your people are, who when the SHIT hits the fan that day, you can go to them and they will be there and they will support you. They will support your initiative. So really actually draw that out, draw the circles, map it out and be there for each other. In the same way that we were doing when we were trying to plan for COVID, we made pods and we made circles of care that we were gonna you know, have around us. We need to do that in these institutions mm. to protect ourselves. We can practice mutual aid. We can practice care circles. We can do things that help to support each other to survive this institution so that we can stay in it for the long haul because we will change these institutions. I mean, the, uh, there is a Krishna Sri Bhagiyadatta who is a Sri Lankan poet and author who was very active here in the 90s and the early 2000s here in Toronto. He used to always talk about institutions that they, were, they either needed to change or they were going to die. Like they were just not going to be relevant. And I think that um, we make these places relevant and so they will change or they won't and the activists have already shown us what they do with that they throw them in the river so we will uh, you know the institutions are ripe for change this is a beautiful revolutionary moment this is a moment for everybody to get involved to touch change mm -hmm. to make these places the places that we've all wanted to be and these are forums these are community centers these are art galleries these are places of inspiration and hope you know these are places of calm and refuse these are places of activism and we can make them all of the the, the, the places that we've always dreamed that they could be together if we're willing to to actually make some changes and I think that right now, what we're seeing is people are willing to make change. Everybody was saying, what, are, what kind of world do I want to come out of COVID into? You know, what kind of, what do we want this place to look like? I don't, I know we don't want our institutions to look exactly the same as they did in March. That was the problem, right? So anyways, we have an opportunity now. So much is possible. I love, Cyrus, how you frame so it great. as an invitation, the invitation to all of us, those working, those in executive, 
I am so tired of the slide and the exit. And when we talk about the exit, we've also, many of us, seen the drawing of people of color coming into spaces and the welcome and the line out. Time for that to be done. I just hope it's seen as like, actually, this is about broadening all of us, our publics and ourselves, not a threat to, uh, not, a, not a threat, but actually an, a welcome and an invitation, which is all of our jobs in our respective ways. Um, I, I think you've been so generous and shared so much that there were, there were a few questions we inserted, but we're gonna need to end soon and Audrey's gonna close us out, but uh, just many thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was just so, I mean, just so refreshing and just reviving what you were saying. I think we we're all like, yeah, okay, yes, yes, we're here. We are going to do this. We are going to, and it's everyone's responsibility. Like, it's not, like, we are all BIPOC right here, but we, it's not only our responsibility, it's everyone's responsibility in order to make this change concrete and in order to make a uh, uh, change for the better. Uh, so I want to thank you both. Um, thank you. Thank, uh, uh, thank you for joining us, sharing your time and your energy. It was so generative. Um, and, uh, you know, we felt your heart in this conversation and, and your passion for change and your passion for education and museums and, and the way that you love them. I think like Deviani and I love them, but want our narratives to be told. Like that's what we are pressing for um, and our voices to be uh, at tables, uh, every level of the, of the table. So uh, thank you so much. Um, our gratitude and I hope these con uh, conversations uh, turn into concrete actions. There's e there is enough of this. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you both so much for this opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for Thanks everyone for joining us, everyone. Mm -hmm. Bye.